Well, please be seated. And uh, please do take out your message outline and also turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Uh, we are looking at verses 8 through 10, but the uh, uh, reason that we read 1 through to 7 as well is to get the context, important, to remind ourselves. Uh, in fact, it was two weeks ago that I spoke on that, so just to remind ourselves. And uh, we are looking at the second of these three parables that Jesus taught that are recorded for us here in this chapter. Now this chapter, as I said last time, is all about heaven's joy, or God's joy, the joy of recovering the lost. The scripture says that when the Christians, <clears throat> when Christians arrive in heaven, they enter into the joy of their Lord. Now I don't know about you, I, I wonder what you think about when you think about heaven. I guess maybe like me, you have lots of different thoughts about what you think heaven is like. Maybe you think of heaven as tranquility. You probably think of peace and holiness and righteousness and purity and the, the shining, blazing glory of God, perhaps. Magnificent, indescribably beautiful surrounding, surroundings. Wonderful fellowship. And all of that is true. Maybe you think of, is, uh, you think of worship. You think of singing and music and people serving the Lord in ways that we can't even comprehend. But really, the ultimate and all-encompassing character of heaven is summed up in the one word, and that is the word joy. It really is a place of joy. Heaven is complete, permanent, eternal, unending, undiminished joy because everything is as it should be. We are fulfilled in every front, in every duty, in every attitude, in every possession, in every relationship. Everything in heaven produces complete satisfaction and fulfillment and completion and therefore produces perfect joy. That's why Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God, heaven, is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, notice, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The perfection of heaven and the eternal presence of God provides, the Bible says, a joy unspeakable and full of glory. That is, that that kind of joy cannot be, <coughs> cannot be described or defined. Now, we experience a measure of that joy here and now, if we're believers in Christ, the joy of knowing that our sins are forgiven, the joy of knowing that our future is in heaven, that it is secure, the joy of anticipating of seeing Christ face to face, the joy of anticipating a, a reunion with believers who have gone on before us, the joy that comes to us now as we anticipate that we will live forever in a place where sin does not exist. And even now, we know the joy of God's forgiveness, the joy of grace, and the joy of God's blessing and guidance and direction, the joy that comes in our heart with the knowledge of the truth. So we already live, if we're Christians, with a measure of joy. In fact, wherever our joy is, and if it's not what it should be, we are commanded, as Paul says in Philippians 4 verse 4, to rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. But one of the components, one of the elements of joy in heaven comes from the salvation of sinners and that's what these parables are all about. <laughs> They're about joy in heaven, they are about God's joy and ultimately God seeks his own joy, God seeks his own glory and has a right to do so. God seeks his own satisfaction, God seeks his own purpose and rightly so. God has a right to do that and to do that right through to the end. He finds full satisfaction and he finds perfect joy. God finds joy in himself while we find our joy in him. So God has this compelling interest in his own joy. And what contributes to his joy, to his rejoicing, is the salvation of the sinner. In fact, Jesus, who is God, in, who is God the Son, said that he came and he went to the cross and he endured the suffering of the cross. For what reason? The joy that was set before him. Well, suffering, pain, dying on a cross... No, it was the joy set before him that he was redeeming sinners. And even the Holy Spirit experiences and desires joy, for it is in the joy, it is joy in the Holy Spirit that marks those of us who are in the kingdom, those of us who are Christians, it marks us by the fruit of the Spirit, and what is it? Love and joy. The joy of God is what this chapter is all about. 
So as we come to the second parable Jesus told, the shortest of the three, there are three elements about God and his character that I think we see here in this parable. So the first, follow on your outline. First is that, and I've said it already, God has joy over the recovery of lost sinners. And the reason that God redeems sinners is for his own joy. The reason that Jesus Christ came into the world to seek and to save the lost was for his own eternal joy. It is this very issue, though, that causes Jesus to be in conflict with the religious leaders of Israel. Because Jesus came down for the joy of God to redeem sinners. And so what did he do? Well, he associated with those who knew that they were sinful. He associated with even the self-righteous who didn't know that they were sinners, but they never took took advantage of the immense, unequaled opportunity to be in his presence. They were too selfish to ever receive from him what he offered. But Jesus spent his time with those who were drawn to him, those who knew that they were sinful, those who were humble and hungry and thirsting after righteousness, those who were spiritually destitute, and as we've seen, over the many months we've been in Luke's Gospel, that put him in conflict with the Pharisees and the scribes. Now remember that the Pharisees and the scribes were the self-styled, self-righteous, self-appointed spiritual leaders of Israel. And one thing characterised them, and it was this. It was an illusion or an image of purity. And it caused them to be unwilling to touch or to get near anybody who was, in their view, unclean. And that certainly meant the riffraff, the the sinners, the tax collectors, and everybody else who fell below their line, their standard. They basically associated with themselves and kept everybody else at a distance. But particularly, as we see in verse 1 here, they didn't like the tax collectors and the sinners because they, for them, were the lowest of the low. They would have absolutely have nothing to do with them whatsoever. And so relentlessly and continuously, they confronted Jesus over his association with sinners. Why? Well, because they didn't know the heart of God, that the heart of God was to rescue sinners, to come all the way down and get close enough to them to embrace them and pick them up in their hopelessness and to bring them into his own presence. They thought that to be like God meant you didn't associate with those types of people. Oh, no, no, no. When the truth of the matter is, is that God in human flesh came into the world and those are the very people he did associate with for the very purposes of redemption to bring joy to the whole trinity. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes separated themselves from everybody that they thought would in any, in any way pollute them or corrupt them or stain them or defile them or intrude on their purity and their holiness. And Jesus, on a regular basis, associated with the very people that they shunned. And they decided that because of that, that was proof that he was not from God because, because they knew the true message from God. They were the true religion. They were the inventors of the true religion. And Jesus, who kept saying that he was from God, he was God, he made himself equal with God, in their view, because of his associations with the unclean, with the tax collectors and sinners, was the fact that, well, he was from Satan because he was so comfortable with Satan's people. So they knew nothing about God. They were as far away from God as you can be. On the other hand... Jesus, as God knew the joy of God, was in the recovery of the lost, and so he came seeking to save sinners for his own joy and the joy of his Father and the joy of the Holy Spirit. In fact, his evangelism, his evangelism as well as our evangelism, in fact, all evangelism, both then and now, is grounded in the joy of God. Why is there a redemptive plan? Why does God provide salvation? Why does God forgive sin? Why does God rescue sinners? Because it brings him glory. And it is for his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness and his compassion and his kindness. And that brings him joy. (coughs) He finds joy in the sinner who is restored and recovered and turned into a true worshipper of him. Jesus associated with sinners, but he didn't sin. He was without sin. He was sinless. But he received sinners with love and grace when they came, humble and seeking salvation for their tormented hearts. He opened the door of his eternal kingdom of salvation and he brought them in. And he told them that he was going to go to heaven 
and he was going to prepare a room for them in the house of the eternal holy God. Now, just for a moment, and I have to say this, that is a staggering thought, isn't it? Just think, for those of us here, sinners saved by grace, what a staggering thought that is, that God, the pure one, will bring us into his very own home. That's staggering, isn't it? And Why does God want all those sinners living in his heavenly house? Because it brings him joy. Immense joy. Now remember, as we've been saying and seeing, that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's moving in that direction since chapter 9, verse 51. He will enter Jerusalem very soon. He's in the last few months of his earthly life. And there, the hurricane of hatred will hit him with its full force. Now the hatred, remember, is being propelled by the Pharisees and the scribes whose hostility continues to increase. And their hostility is, is collecting hostility among the people that they are actually influencing, the crowds that are following. Now in this text, that hostility again surfaces, and we see it there in verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That was an outrage to them. As the self-appointed righteousness, righteous of Israel, they were the final court on everybody. They gave all the verdicts. They were the self-appointed judges of everyone, including Jesus. And their judgment was Jesus was doing what no person who represents God would ever do, hanging around with the unrighteous, with the wicked, with the sinners. Now, their regular criticism was always associated with the fact that he was spending his time with the unscrupulous and despised collaborators with Rome who bought tax franchises and they extorted money out of the Jewish people. Therefore, they were traitors to their very own people and their religion and their God, in their view. They were equally, if not more, outraged that he ate with sinners. And sinners is a word used 13 times by Luke, always with the same meaning. It means moral lawbreakers, adulterers, prostitutes, the scum, the riffraff. For them, Jesus' association with these kinds of people was all they needed to convince everybody else that he was not of God. And the language in verse 2 is quite interesting. Notice he says, this man welcomes sinners, they said. It means the kind of reception that you would have for somebody who is actually a member of your family. In fact, it means that Jesus doesn't just welcome them, he embraces them. He puts his arms around them, he pulls them in like they were family. Well, that was proof positive to whose family he belongs to, and then, that's bad enough, he then eats with them. Now, this is outrageous because in the ancient Near East and in the Middle East, eating with somebody was a sign of approval and affirmation. Probably, if you were a, a rabbi or a Pharisee or a spiritual leader, and the rabbis used to say that whenever they ate with anybody, they convey to that person affirmation and spiritual blessing. So Jesus was eating with sinners, was a way to give approval to them in their view. And so here again, they make the same complaint against Jesus, completely misunderstanding the heart of God for sinners. And Jesus answers their murmurs with these three stories. Now, the first two are a prologue. The main story actually starts in verse 11, the one which we know as the prodigal son. The longest parable Jesus ever taught, and actually a really full and rich, as we will see. But he opens up his response to them with a little prologue from verses 4 through 10, in which he tells two simple stories. Now, keep in mind that his main target in this chapter is the Pharisees and the scribes who are complaining against him and criticizing him. They are the target. They are the ones he is going to expose. Now, they don't appear in the first and the second story, but they do in the third. In the first and second story, Jesus tells a story or a parable in the form of a question, and he pulls them into it. So they have to think like a shepherd, and they have to think like a woman, and therefore they're implicated in the story without actually being one of the characters in the story. But when it comes to the third and the main parable, the one that occupies the bulk of this chapter, now it's not just implicating them in the story, they're in it. They're in that story. 
In fact, the Pharisees and the scribes appear in the third story as the older brother, the self-righteous, smug older brother who is miserably unhappy, envious and jealous over the father's celebration of his son who has been restored. So they are implied in the first two, but they are explicitly identified in the character of the older son in the third story. But in all three stories, however, they are exposed as having no concept of the heart of God. They really are the ones on Satan's side because they have no interest in the joy of God. They have no interest in the activity that brings celebration to heaven. They have nothing to do with what's going on in heaven. So that's the first thing. That's a bit of a review. I appreciate that. That's the context. But that's the thing we need to understand. The whole chapter is about the joy of God. Second then, God's relentless search for lost sinners. Now, remember the first story? Verses 4 to 7 about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and lost one of them. What would you do? He asked the Pharisees and scribes, if you were that shepherd and you had a hundred and you lost one. Well, you left the 99 in the open pasture and you'd go after the lost one, wouldn't you? And they'd all affirm that that was right. That's what you did. That's what you'd have to go and do. It says he found it, laid it on his shoulders, brought it back, called his friends and neighbours, say, said to them, hey, come and rejoice with me. I found my sheep which was lost. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes, they would agree with that. They would affirm that. That was the right thing to do. And then in verse 7, Jesus makes the application. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. See how far away you are from heaven, he says? You're the 99 self-righteous righteous in a sarcastic way, by the way, who need no repentance. You give heaven no joy. Heaven's joy is found in one sinner who repents. How far from heaven they really are. They knew what a shepherd would do. He would go find the lost sheep because he had a duty to do it. He had a responsibility to do it because the sheep had value. Uh, They would affirm that that is the ethical, dutiful thing to do. What superficiality, though, they exhibit, what hypocrisy, they understood finding a sheep, they would have understood finding a coin, they would have understood the celebration, but they had no interest in finding a lost soul with infinitely more value. But the heart of God reaches out to sinners in love and compassion and grace and mercy to save them. And so continuing to confront them, Jesus tells the second story about this woman who lost a coin. I'm in the parable now, in case you're wondering. And the setting again is village life. We need to think like this. We're in the little Middle Eastern village in the land of Israel, down a little dirt road perhaps. And along the little dirt road in a small little village, there's some little brick houses made out of bricks and mud and straw. And the little houses are along this little road. Picture that, sort of down the middle, houses all along the sides, that sort of thing. That was this village. That's very common there. They would understand that. They would know this very well. The picture is of a simple people, a poor people, who face a serious matter in the story. The woman has a big problem. She loses something of great value. Now, they didn't have a lot of money. In fact, they didn't use money in the same way that we use money today. They lived in a sort of a sort of a bartering society, uh, as many people have throughout history, and actually even some do today, don't they? They swapped this or that for what they needed, uh, even their own services and labour perhaps. And so money was not used at the pace it is used for us today. And a little bit of money could go a very long way. And this woman in the story has ten silver coins and she loses one and she finds it and she has a party. Now you might say, well man, village life must be really dull if they're just having a party after she finds a coin. I mean, Really? And you might conclude that that is the case. And I think probably life was fairly dull at times. But I want to take you into the story and I want to kind of put you into the position of the Pharisees who were here in the story. Because you remember in verse 4, Jesus says, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and they would have gone, oh, no, 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 no. Because a shepherd to them was unclean. They wouldn't have anything to do with a shepherd. They wouldn't be a shepherd. They wouldn't go near a shepherd. And Jesus says, hey, suppose one of you And he had caused them, in their minds, to think of themselves as a shepherd, and thus they had been defiled. Jesus loved to assault their foolish pride. Now he makes them act in their minds as if they were not a shepherd, but, dare I say, a woman. 
Oh, the horror of all horrors. Now, before some of you women go on to lynch me for a minute, I'm definitely not being sexist. I'm preaching the text, okay? Look, verse 8, he says to them, or suppose a woman. Wow. That would be viewed by them as an absolute outright insult to address Pharisees and scribes and ask them to put themselves in a woman's place to evaluate how a woman would think and how she would behave. I mean, shepherds were unclean and women were unrespected. In fact, in the Middle Eastern culture, it was an insult to compare a male audience to a woman. Now, here again, Jesus just sweeps away their foolish pride. He, he does it mercifully, since God only gives grace to the humble, and sooner or later they're going to they're be humbled if they're ever going to come into his kingdom. But women, in this period of time, in the time when Jesus was on earth, was, they were viewed with contempt. The Pharisees actually were the ones that led the parade. They got up every day, I, I found this out, they got up every day, this is what they would do, several times a day, they would say this, they would pray to God, they would say, I thank you, O God, that I am not a woman. That's what they did. That's how they viewed women. They wouldn't be a shepherd, and they certainly wouldn't be a woman. So Jesus says to them, hey, what if you were a shepherd? What if you were a woman? What would you do? And he pushes them into this mental place to have to think like a shepherd and think like a woman, and thus they are intellectually being defiled. So they think. They will be outraged by this, but they couldn't avoid it. Jesus disturbs their prejudices greatly. Verse 8, or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Now again, picture that little village, a dusty road somewhere in Judea, Israel, a little village, a little home perhaps with four walls, a little low doorway, no windows, Maybe a slit uh, above eye level to let the smoke out from the fire inside and maybe, maybe it causes a little bit of ventilation, uh, perhaps. Floors would have been made out of dirt. They were, were hard yet dusty on the surface. And there are cracks, there is dust. This woman is in this little house and she's lost one of her 10 silver coins. Uh, and a silver coin would be about 4.3 grams of silver. The Greeks called it a drachma. The Romans would call it a denarius. Uh, that would be about a day's wage. That's the value of that coin. But in the case of this woman, while it is possible that this could just be a sum of money that she had, like, I don't know, cash for family needs over the next months or weeks, they didn't spend their money at a rapid rate as we would. Even though it was perhaps a day's wages, it wouldn't necessarily need to spend it every day. So this would be some money that they would that they could use perhaps down the road, you know, in the shops and that sort of stuff. But in ancient times, women would very often take the coins and they would have, and they would sort of wrap them in some kind of rag and tie it in a knot. You know, the, old, the, the original purse or something like that, I don't know. Uh, and the money would be there and it would be all knotted up and it would be kept there for safekeeping and the woman would put it in a safe place. But there is also a possibility here that, may, and maybe this is more likely, it could be her dowry. You see, women were given a dowry by their fathers. Uh, on occasions, their husband would even give them a dowry because it would act as security for their future. Uh, and some of those women would put that around their neck. They'd wear these coins like a necklace. They would run a cord through the coins. They would pierce it, and they would sort of uh, maybe put a bag with the coins in it, and they would, they would basically have it tied tightly around their neck. They'd have it there. So, so it was security. They knew where it was. And this would be their future. What if their husband dies? If their husband falls ill? If there's a disaster in the family? This, this is their security. That's what it was. Well, it could have been any one of these things, but whatever it is, it is in a poor village family. The amount is, in, is significant, and one-tenth of this amount is significant too. There's not only the duty of being responsible, but this has real value. Uh, another place that women often did this was that they would get the coins and they would saw this as their security, as, as their dowry, and they would, they would basically place it in their hair. So they would sort of wear all these coins in their hair. I don't know if it's the fashion of the time. I don't know whether you ladies fancy trying that. I don't know, a few pound coins in your hair later, I don't know. But, but that's what they would do. They would do that. It was basically so they knew where it was. It was important to them. They wanted to keep it secure. That's what they did. And she knew she was responsible. She knew that this was a great loss and there was really no option. So Jesus asked the question that is going to demand the right answer. If you were this woman and you lost one of these coins, what would you do? 
Well, they know that she had only one choice. You wouldn't say, ah, well, it doesn't really matter. This is a poor family. Of course it matters. And so she searches for the coin. Verse 8. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? She loses one coin, she lights the lamp, she sweeps the house, she searches carefully before, until she finds it. It's got value, plus she, plus, plus, you know, look, women are really special about this stuff, aren't they? I mean, some of us men, we just go, ah, whatever, forget it, and that sort of stuff. I mean, Sarah, she's under the bed, she's everywhere, she's in the wardrobe, she's lifting up the sofa, she's pulling the house apart just to find, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, blokes were like, yeah, well, whatever, you know, that sort of stuff. Maybe women attach more sentimental value to things, I don't know. Well, this is more than sentimental value. This really matters. So the diligent search goes on. The lamp is lit, probably a clay little lamp with oil in it, a little wick in it. Light the wick, and she's going around. She's looking every nook and corner and cranny, and she gets out maybe a little twig uh, broom that maybe she made or she bartered from someone down the road, I don't know, from a neighbor, and she's sweeping away. Even on the hard floor of dirt, there's dust on the top. It's a very dry place. And she's sweeping it, trying to find it. Maybe it's in a crack. Maybe it's under the dirt. Maybe it's under something. Maybe it's under a chair or, or some kind. And it says she searches carefully. It means to have an urgent sense of care. She reaches with a little broom every corner of the house, moves everything, lifts anything it might have rolled under. She looks everywhere by this little small light. And she keeps doing it until it's found. Notice at the end of verse 8, until she finds it. Verse 9, and when she finds it. She's going to do it until she finds it. Why? Because it is precious. It belongs to her. It's lost. It needs to be recovered. It's the same as the shepherd back in verse 4, isn't it? Whatever it takes. And Jesus' audience absolutely understood this. It's perfectly clear. Verse 9, And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. Let's have a party, she says. Friends and neighbours, by the way, it's different from back in verse 6 where the shepherd calls his friends and neighbours. Here the word friend and the word neighbour are both feminine in the Greek. That's interesting because she calls for her female friends. And that was pretty typical uh, because men stayed with men in that culture and women with women. women. They were very close in these little villages. They all knew each other. Everybody's suffering would be everybody else's suffering. And uh, they would have this wonderful little party because she's found what she lost. And the point of the Pharisees is this. You understand that, don't you, Jesus is saying. They'd buy into the story. They would buy into the ethical response of the woman. She did exactly what she should have done. It's what they would have done. And therefore, thirdly, all heaven rejoices over finding the lost sinner. And then here comes the application. Verse 10. In the same way, and I have this picture that Jesus is pointing the finger at them at this moment, as he did, I think, earlier on. I tell you, that's emphatic. I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. In a similar sense, just like that woman, she calls her friends to rejoice over the, over the recovering of a lost coin. I tell you, Pharisees, I tell you, he says. And he points right at them. There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And they're just so far from that. Here is Jesus. He is saying, look, I'm doing this because this brings joy to God. He gets no joy out of you 99 self-righteous people. His joy is in the recovery of the repenting sinner, the people you don't associate with. And look at that phrase. There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God. Now, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Can you see what's being said there? Look what it says. You might assume immediately that this is all about the angels rejoicing. It's not. Look at it. It doesn't say that. It says, look, there is rejoicing or joy in the presence of the angels of God. Where the angels are, there is joy. And the angels, where are they? They are in the presence of God where God is. Where is the joy coming from? The joy is coming from God. He is the one in view here in verse 7 when it says rejoicing in heaven and it's the joy of God that fills heaven. It's the joy of God that surrounds the angels. He is the one who fills heaven with joy. Now of course they share in this joy and they rejoice. 
In fact, let me, let's get a little glimpse of heaven. You up for a little bit of glimpse of heaven? Good, excellent, because I'm going to do it anyway. So, Revelation 4, you get a glimpse of heaven. Look at this. I might get excited. This is really the best look at what's going on in heaven, and it is a celebration. In Revelation chapter 4, you have the throne of God, verses 1 and 2. God is on the throne in all his splendor and in all his glory. He is surrounded by angels. He is surrounded by 24 elders, which represents the redeemed, and they're all surrounding God. And in verse 8, this is what they are saying. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Verse 11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they will they were created and have their being. And there's a whole lot of praise going on in heaven because God has created. They are worshipping the creator God. But when you come into Revelation 5, the praise goes up a notch, the praise takes a little different turn because we find those around the throne, the angels and the redeemed, verses 9 and 10, they are singing a new song. And they sang a new song, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Now they're praising God, the Lamb, for redemption. But then, verses 11 and 12, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. That's a lot of angels, by the way. They encircled the throne and the living creatures, that is, special angels, and the elders, the redeemed. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Well, everybody's having a right good praise time up in heaven, aren't they? Everybody's worshipping. That's the joy of heaven. And everybody's celebrating not only the God of creation, but here's the thing, the God of redemption. Everybody's participating in the joy of God, but the source of this joy is God. God. And the angels just echo the joy of God. Now, the angels don't personally experience salvation. Fallen angels fell and are not redeemed. Holy angels never fell and therefore need no redemption. They have no experience of redemption, but they enter into the joy of God. And the Christians, the redeemed, they too enter into the joy of God as those who've experienced redemption. By the way, just in a general sense, angels, let's talk a little bit about angels because that's probably the reasons why you've come out because I mentioned angels this morning. They have a great interest in the things that occupy the heart of God. They love God perfectly. They serve God perfectly. They enter into God's joy. That's why in Matthew 18, verse 10, Jesus says, Don't despise or belittle any believer. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now, that's an interesting verse, isn't it? I think it's the holy angels. The holy angels watch the face of the Father, and when the Father's face picks up concern over how one of his children is being treated... They're ready to be dispatched to the aid of that child as those who minister to those who are God's. Isn't that a good thought? They are concerned about what concerns the heart of God. They pick up his concern off of his face. And they also pick up his joy. In Matthew 25, 31, it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. When Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom for all of his redeemed, hey, the angels are going to be there. They have a full interest in the unfolding redemptive history. And when did that start? Well, that started even at the beginning, at the beginning of the work of Christ. And remember, the angels were there too, weren't they? Luke chapter 2, remember the shepherds were out in the field. Who shows up? The angels. Look, verses 10 to 11. They say, do not be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy. You see that? That will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And then, all the angels respond to the birth of the Saviour in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. Why do the angels rejoice and celebrate? Because a Saviour has been born? 
because they know this brings about salvation, which brings joy to God. The angels have a great interest in redemption. Why? Because they share in the joy of God. Now, these Pharisees and the scribes and anybody else who has no interest in lost sinners being recovered don't understand the joy of God or the joy of the angels or the joy of the redeemed in heaven. So if you ask the simple question, what goes on in heaven, it's pretty easy to sum up, isn't it? The worship of God. The exaltation of Christ, the fullness of holiness and endless perfect joy. And right now, it's all going on. As one sinner after another is sought and found and recovered, the party never ends. God places the highest value on the worth of a sinner, one soul recovered, very unlike the frauds and fakes who serve Satan, have no love for the lost. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, you only make more sons of hell with your efforts. So the indictment is inescapable. Jesus is saying to them, look, how can you affirm the ethical responsibility of a shepherd to find a sheep? How can you affirm the importance of a woman finding the coin and utterly be utterly critical of me recovering lost souls. How can you understand the joy of a village of men and the joy of the village of women and not the joy of God? How can you condemn me for doing what brings God joy? And the theology and the Christology here becomes very clear. Let me take you back through the story again and I'll show it to you. It is God in Christ who is that woman. God doesn't mind being compared to a woman, by the way. It is God in Christ who is that woman seeking the lost sinner, hiding in the cracks, in the dust and in the debris of a dirty world of sin. It is God in Christ who initiates the search for the sinner because that sinner belongs to him. That sinner is in the house of his own sovereign election. It is God in Christ who initiates the search and it is God alone who finds because the coin is lifeless and dead and can do nothing on its own. It is God in Christ who searches intently, who comes all the way down to this world, all the way down to death, even death on a cross. It is God who turns on the light of the gospel to sweep, to search, to pursue the sinner in every dark and hidden place. It is God in Christ who shines the light of the glorious gospel of Christ on that one lost sinner. It is God in Christ who reaches down and picks up the sinner and restores him back to the heavenly treasury where his name has been written since the foundation of this world. And it is God then who breaks loose in joy into which all of the holy inhabitants of heaven, people and angels, enter. The celebrations of heaven are not just for the recovered coin and the recovered sheep, but for the recoverer himself, God himself. For God, it it is costly grace because he was exposed to sin for the first time in his eternal existence. He came down and he lived with sinners down in the dirt, down in the debris, down in the cracks. But in that costly grace was great power because the coin was lifeless, hidden in the darkness, but he had the power to find us, to pick us up and to carry us back. And there is no other religion that has a God like this who seeks and saves unworthy sinners because they have value in his view. Because they are his own. They are eternally elect. There is no God in any other religion who goes to find his enemies and makes them his friends and builds them a home, a room in his own house for the sheer joy that he receives in saving them. There is no God like this who then takes them to live with him forever. Friends, this is our God. And by the way, this should be our character too, of those who who truly represent our God. I hope the recovery of lost sinners is your supreme joy. One final thing, verse 10. I'm nearly done. Notice the sinner repents. Do you see that? Over one sinner who repents. It's the same in verse 7, isn't it? Uh, The sheep is helpless, the sheep is near dead, can do nothing, has to be picked up, put on the shepherd's back and carried back. Notice again, as I said last time, the shepherd carries the full burden, the full weight of the search. 
uh, the, 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 to find uh, the, the carrying, the recovery, the restoration. Notice the coin is helpless, it is dead, it is lifeless. The Lord has to do all the finding and all the restoration. But Jesus makes this very clear that this does not happen, notice, without repentance. And you say, well, isn't that only half of the deal? Repentance, turning from sin? What about the other half? The only thing that will cause you to turn from sin would be that you found something greater, isn't it? The assumption, whenever the New Testament talks about true repentance, is that it implies that you're turning from and turning to. That is repentance, isn't it? It's that complete turning around, isn't it? I turn from my sin, I turn to Christ. And Jesus makes it very clear that it never happens apart from repentance. And this is really important in both of these two stories, and it comes to full bloom in the story of the prodigal son, doesn't it? Because there we exactly see, we see exactly what repentance looks like there in that parable of the prodigal son. But to find out what that really is all about, you're going to have to come back next Sunday. Let's pray. (coughs) Father, we just thank you for the richness of your word. Father, we thank you that there is a celebration going on in heaven right now because there is joy in heaven when one sinner is found. And Lord, there are many sinners being found even now. Father, we thank you that the joy of God is found in uh, seeking and searching and eventually finding lost sinners. Lord, may that be our supreme joy too. There are many things that bring us pleasure in this world and we praise you for that. There is much that we can enjoy, but our ultimate joy should be the joy and the celebration and the wonder of sinners who are saved and found and are restored. And so, Father, we thank you for for just this very simple story that Jesus told, but we thank you for what it means. And it reminds us, too, that if we're a believer in Christ, we were once lost, but you found us. Maybe you found us like that coin that was in the the dirt and the dust. Maybe we went really low. Maybe we didn't, but you found us. You went searching for us. You did everything you could, and you found us, and you restored us, and that brings you joy. Father, we praise you for what that means, and may we celebrate too, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.